the next area we are looking at is nervous system a nervous system is a system that makes us to be aware of changes around us not only man when we say us I mean living things as a whole plants and animals are reacting to environments because of their sensitivity to the environment why in higher organisms we can talk about nervous system in plants we talk about reaction to environment which is irritability so we are going to look at nervous system in animals and how plants react to the environment nervous system as defined earlier on is a system that enables higher organisms to be aware and react to changes in the environment. The system comprises the brain and the spinal cord and the nerves, which are motor nerves, sensory nerves, and intermediate nerves. The system is also divided into central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system which comprises the the nerves then the other one is autonomic nervous system that control the involuntary actions in the internal organs reactions are grouped to voluntary actions involuntary actions and reflex actions so so also learned reflexes are also called conditioned reflexes. Plants do not have nerves, but carry out various forms of sensitivities, such as tropism, nastic movements, and tactic movements. Lower organisms also show these movements in response to stimuli, just as the plants. These sensitivities we are saying, talking about is re movement actions. For instance, tropism is a directional growth movement, a unidirectional growth movement due to unilateral stimulus. Nastic, nastic movement is when the parts of the plant move by like folding of the leaves as seen in sensitive plants. Tactic movement is movement of the whole body, which is demonstrated by uh, unicellular uh, organisms. And when we talk about plants, now we're talking about algae and so on. So let's use some examples. Example one the hearing and stability of man is located in A. Forebrain, B. Midbrain, C. Hindbrain, and D. Medulla oblongata. Hearing and stability. So we are looking at the function of the parts of the brain. For brain, as we have cerebral, center of reasoning, learning, and so on. B is midbrain that joins the hindbrain to the forebrain. C, hindbrain, that is where you have cerebellum. And cerebellum is for balancing and also hearing. D medulla oblongata is the lower part the, at the base of uh, the cerebellum, that is the high brain. So me medulla oblongata is part of the high brain. But the answer here is C, high brain. Because medulla oblongata controls uh, reflex actions that involve movement. Example 2. A doctor who was carrying out surgical operation on a patient is under A. Voluntary action, B. Involuntary action, C. Reflex action, and D. Conditional. Obviously, conditional is out of it. Conditional what? Now, a voluntary action that is action taken under the control of cerebrum is action taken after proper 
reasoning. Then B, involuntary action. This is the action you take without your will. It's, it's the, the action is going on without you deciding whether to take it or not. In example, your heartbeat, your breathing, all those ones don't control it. They are involuntary actions. Then C, reflex actions. Those are stereotype, fast, and then uh, unconscious actions. So, as a, a doctor that is carrying out a surgical operation, is thinking properly before doing anything. Every step is taken, he reason it out. So, A is the answer. Voluntary action. Number three, the concern are found in dash and they are sensitive to dash light. This are special cells found in retina of the eye. We have two types, the cone cells and the rod cells. Now, the cone cells are sensitive to color. Now, the one sensitive to color and uh, very active in bright light. So let's see the one that option that fit the position of cone cells and uh, what type of light it works with. A choroid and dim light. Cones are not found in the choroid. Choroid is the second layer of retina that gives pigmentation to our eye. B, retina and dim light. Cone cells are found in retina, but they are not sensitive to dim light. C, sclera and bright light. Cone cells are not found in sclera. The sclera is the tough, inelastic, whitish part of the eye. So, it's not the answer. D, retina, yes, and corals are sensitive to bright light. So, answer is D. Number four, the control of excess light from getting to retina involves the following except A. Signal from parasympathetic nervous system. B. Contraction of radial muscles and the iris of the iris. C. Narrowing of the pupil. Then D. Contraction of secular muscles of the iris. Now, we are talking about preventing excess light from getting to the retina in the eye. And to prevent excess light from getting to the retina, the pupil must be reduced. Pupil is the space you find in the, in the center of the iris. So, if the space, that is the pupil, should be reduced, the radial muscle must not contract because if the radial muscle contract it will pull the iris apart and the pupils will be widened but before action will be taken there must be signal from uh, autonomic nervous system which is made up of parasympathetic nerves and uh, sympathetic nerves of course, it is parasympathetic nerves that control this, the iris. So, A is correct. C, narrowing of the pupil. Yes, that will be narrowed to reduce the amount of light that goes in. Contraction of secular muscles will bring about the narrowing of the pupil. Of the pupil. So, out of the two muscles in the iris it is the radial muscle that will relax while the secular muscle contract for the pupil to be uh, reduced so the one that is contradicting in this statement in um, among the option is contraction of radial muscles of the iris so b is the exception which is the answer to the question number five which of these parts is correct in transmission of impulses 
from receptors to central nervous system and then to effectors. A. Receptors through afferent nerves, through dosa root to spinal cord, from there through efferent nerves, through ventral root to effectors. B. Receptor through efferent nerves, through ventral root, through spinal cord, through afferent nerves, through dosa root, and then to effector. C. Receptors through sensory nerves, through ventral root, through spinal cord, through motor nerves, through dosa root, through effectors. And finally, D. Receptors through motor nerves, through dosa root, through spinal cord, then through efferent nerves, through ventral root, to effectors. You can only answer this question if you understand your reflex arc. So let's look at the reflex arc. This is the structure of a reflex arc. So with this understanding of the reflex arc, we can now answer the question. Remember, transmission commences from the receptor passing through the sensory nerve or efferent nerve through the dosa root of the spinal cord into the spinal cord. Then process information is sent in form of impulses through the motor nerve. Motor nerve. This is the motor nerve. Motor nerve or affer efferent nerve. This one is afferent nerve. This one is inferent nerve and is passing through the, the, the ventral root. This is the dosa root. Let us now answer the question number five. Let's, cause, let's start our consideration from D. The path through which impulses is transmitted from receptor, there is receptor through motor nerves. So this option D is out. C. From receptor to sensory nerves, yes. To ventral root, no. It's to dosal root. C is out. B. Receptor to inferent nerves, that's correct. To ventral root, even this root is wrong. So that one is out. Our answer is A. Re receptors passing impulses to afferent nerves, to dosal root to the spinal cord from spinal cord to efferent nerves, that is motor nerves, through ventral root to effector. So our answer is A.